The big yearly AAA shooter wave is upon us, and there's a few reasons why it is more interesting this time. Battlefield 2142 is trying to do things very much for its own fans, so that's interesting. Over in Call of Duty land, we have a few other interesting things going on, including now the mass market normalization of kernel level anti-cheat solutions. Now, this is a story that first truly cropped up in the public consciousness with Valorant. League of Legends' is game, which took an extremely hardcore and serious stance on its anti-cheat with a, well, a big, powerful solution that, from what I understand, is indeed highly successful. It is just a bit more intrusive, a lot more intrusive, you could say, than um, most anti-cheat solutions that are out there. So let's talk about this new Warzone cheat prevention system first. Um, now, the first thing... The scale to which cheating has messed up Battle Royale games is massive. I remember this as a PUBG player, and from what I hear from the COD people, it is really, really bad in Warzone. So they have got decently militant about this. They uh, make regular big posts about the ban waves that they do, which is certainly a good thing. And this week they have revealed Ricochet. Right. Uh, now, ricochet, fun thing from Connell, is the term used throughout the COD franchise to describe damage received from trying to grief teammates with friendly fire. So, nice, uh, nice little naming. Also, you know, ricochet, collateral damage, unintended consequences, kernel level access. That's the other way you could take ricochet if you wanted to go in that direction. So, and then also quite funny that um, the Valorant kernel level anti-cheat is called Vanguard. <laughs> Yep, I mean, I actually thought that was interesting because I googled uh, Vanguard Anti-Cheat to see what it would look like. And I was like, oh yeah, Valorant's just not there anywhere. So they've kind of captured that entire name and kind of probably mess it, like muddled it a little bit so it won't be quite as clear cut. Certainly, certainly a good name and decision, I think. Yeah, so basically, they just talk about overall more security is going on. Uh, this will be coming as a part of Warzone specific update. It will be in Call of Duty Vanguard at launch, of course, and it has some PC focused uh, features because PC, of course, is the most targeted by cheating, but because of crossplay, it impacts everybody else. So, in addition to server enhancements coming with Ricochet anti cheat, is the launch of a new PC kernel level driver internally developed for the Call of Duty franchise and launching first for Warzone that will uh, assist in the identification of cheaters, reinforcing and strengthening overall server security. Or so you might think, and they would hope, because this has actually been leaked. Uh, more on that in a little bit. We've got the story first, but uh, yeah, the leak's really rough. The kernel level driver launches along with the Pacific update. Now, kernel level driver, that can give people the willies based on what went on with the little bit more rocky launch of Valorant's Vanguard anti cheat, not to be consumed or confused with Ricochet anti cheat in COD Vanguard. <laughs> um, now, there's basically had uh, was the problems people had. I mean, number one, for some people, it was a point of principle just saying, this is too much access to my computer, I'm not comfortable with this. But also, um, there were concerns about it affecting performance, and also that it was always on, even when the game wasn't on. That could actually happen, which people did not think was acceptable. Now, Activision, in the reveal, were trying to be quite clear to um, sort of head off this situation, basically saying that, uh, well, yeah, saying that it's only going to be operating when you're playing the game on PC, and the kernel level driver only monitors and actively reports to uh, you know to Call of Duty. Who knows? I mean, it's the sort of thing where with Valorant, that is a new game where people hadn't felt the problem of the cheating. Whereas I think with Call of Duty, with Warzone, a lot of those players are going to be a lot more welcoming of something like this because a lot of their play experience has been ravaged. And especially in a game like Warzone, all it takes is one or two cheaters and that disrupts the gameplay experience of, what, 100 people, right, in, in every match. That is obviously terrible. One cheater is able to do far more damage in a Battle Royale game than they are able to in, uh, you know, a 4v4 lobby. So I think the reasoning here is justified. It's just the thing then of it's up to the consumer. Are you happy for that kernel level access or not? Um, that's mostly it. I think for most players, given the scale of the problem, they'll probably think that the benefits outweigh the risks. I think that's what the that's why they're 
I think rather rolling it out in Warzone first as opposed to Vanguard, and this is why I think this is the time that'll stick. Every every other time there's been some form of anti-cheat has been uh, like rallied against, at least at the kernel level, largely because from a principle perspective that people uh, don't like it. So you go, well, I'm not going to start playing Valorant because you want access to my machine to, to start. Mm -hmm. But for Warzone, it's going to be, oh, so the literal outcome, the literal, you know, the, the, the end that these means will bring us to is substantially worth it. It'll be a fantastic improvement to the experience. So I think people are going to be really happy with it overall. Yeah. Even though there will be people shouting, no, this is not like, this is not the principle we want to have. We want our privacy. If more people are going, I, I don't care about privacy. I'd rather have, you know, or I don't see a big impact in the moment. I'd rather just play Warzone and it'd be good. Yeah. And it's like the, you could argue, you know, there are different approaches to anti-cheat that you could take versus having kernel level access. And so far, none are quite as effective because I saw this conversations kind of crop up in and around uh, using CSGO as a comparison because Valve obviously being Valve are like we're not going to do that no 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 no. that's not what we do we're going to do machine learning stuff mm -hmm. so we're going to have a ton of we're going to have I can't remember what they call it but whatever their kind of oversight thing is it that checks for cheaters in games you lose men that's war <laughs> Sometimes the only way to honor a fallen soldier is to finish the mission. The the overall takeaway is that's yeah. not. It's just this is basically the way forward if you don't want cheaters because cheaters are just too good. Which is, you know, yeah, not, and the way around it. From a from a money perspective, like if cheating ruins people's experience enough and there are similar products on the market, people are gonna go. And even if Apex Legends has got a cheating and hacking problem, well, a Warzone only player won't have felt that problem, but they will feel the Warzone problem. So maybe they'll hop into Apex. You know, maybe there's not yeah. a, in the first lobbies they go into, there isn't a big cheating problem. So they get a decent experience and then they've lost a retained user. So I imagine that's a lot of the justification of the business side. Hmm. So then let's talk about the leak aspect of this story. Because the driver leaked within a day of being announced is pretty bad. Warzone hackers have already got their hands on this software after a major file leak exposed its kernel level driver and they're busy reverse engineering it. Now it makes sense that the Warzone hackers would be the ones doing this um, because it is basically a hacker's paradise uh, according to Dex Erdo, and that's exactly what I always hear about it as well. Um, so yeah, rough. Now this has been picked up by um, community um, outlets as well. Uh, the Anti-Cheat Police Department, which is a volunteer watchdog who basically is into disrupting cheat sellers, um, said this. We talked to a reverse engineer on his uh, thoughts on the driver, and we concluded it is nothing <laughs> that special, really. They collect a lot of user information, which they did before it went kernel level. Their protection to the driver is not that great and will be reversed easily. That's quite rough. So it basically seems to have its own issues and also be pretty easy to crack, which is definitely bad. And uh, the hackers are also not particularly scared of it. I mean, here's another tweet from them. Cheat developers are not afraid of ricochet anti-cheat. And to be fair, most cheats already operate at the kernel level for a very long time. It is down to developers at ricochet if they have the skills to detect these cheats now. The playing ground is even. So basically it means this this is like the basis at which they can fight some of these hacks so they are going to be better equipped than they were before but uh, by no means the slam dunk that they sort of hyped it up and marketed it as now the saving grace here is that ricochet has not been released it's going to launch um, alongside uh, well with Call of Duty Vanguard. So they can start doing the reverse engineering which Activision can probably snoop into so this, in a way, could allow them to uh, work on some exploits early before it actually is out in a live environment. And indeed, some people do think it was leaked on purpose to allow that to happen. Which, I could, I can totally see why you would say that. I just think the PR hit here is bad to the point where they, they just know they don't want a negative story going on. So that's basically it with the Ricochet leak. It's uh, not a great look for them. Yeah, and I think if you were if you were going to leak something, you wouldn't do it less than a month before launch, because that's not going to be enough time to see the results of everything and actually make your way around it. 
I feel like without seeing an Activision response, it's hard to know what they're actually thinking or doing. But fundamentally, as far as I understand, this has just kind of rendered most of it useless. Even when it's not even that strong to begin with, according to you know uh, the reverse engineering lads, there's a there's a whole big conversation here that uh, uh, the reverse engineer uh, I can't remember his name now, uh, Dax Rind. He's, I've actually been following him for a while. He does some interesting stuff, but it's just like this is the last line of defense, kernel level stuff, and now it's just kind of in the bin. Mm. At least as far as Ricochet is concerned. So I feel like uh, it's it's very unfortunate, very unfortunate that they're they're uh, marketed this really heavily. And even honestly, something twigged to me whenever they they marketed it and they had this really big uh, bold statement about how like you know uh, Call of Duty we don't tolerate cheaters. See you soon. Or was like see you tomorrow. I think something like yeah. that. And you're like this is going to go wrong. There's no way you're not going to bash yourselves here. And I think it's happened. Yeah, the weight of their marketing has uh, been perfectly turned against them. Yep. Absolutely. And I have to wonder how the hell it leaked. Yeah, that's I mean, surprising to me. I imagine when you're doing this, there are so many people along the chain. Because you're going to be, you know, you're likely going to be involving infosec experts. This isn't this isn't going to be something that's just done Activision in house by game developers. This is going to involve, you know, infosec experts. And I think there's enough black hats in there that you know you gotta gotta be careful who you're talking to. Who yeah, let's see things. And I suppose there is quite a financial incentive. And I even remember for World of Warcraft yeah. with the likes of Glider and the various different bots that would operate for that. There was like serious multi million dollar businesses ran in uh well in that part of the market yep it's that's one of the things that i think people don't consider too much is the actual money behind it i know there was a story broke uh ah oh, when was it it was it was a decent while ago maybe it's some, maybe over a year ago but it was a police raid on a cheating group in china and they confiscated like millions and they were yeah. like, the, the, it's, they, they basically, you know, showed themselves off because there were all these people who didn't have any real form of income that was notable. And they were all driving like on just cars worth just under a mil. And you're like, <laughs> well, how have you done this? And the police were like, oh, yep, yeah, well, we'll just sweep in, take all of it because this is literally a so silly. likely a billion dollar industry when you consider all of the games and all of the different sort of yeah. uh, motives involved everywhere. That's well, the sort of thing, like, I mean, even when, like, local police are trying to catch someone who's dealing, they mm. will look for anachronistic parts of their life that have got, you know, to do with money. Yeah. So going around in a bunch of Lambos if you're <laughs> trying to hide your cash seems like a silly way to do things. Um, yep. But, yeah, it's a massive industry. There's a large financial incentive. I would not be surprised if that had anything to do with uh, this leaking, actually. <laughs> um, mm. So there you go. We will just have to wait and see. Perhaps this does mean that uh, all the White Hats can start to work on shoring up their defenses um because indeed you know some of those white hats are maybe going to be good at sleuthing around finding out what the reverse engineers are doing and uh, you know preemptively solving issues before it comes out so yes this is a big suck but also there could be a bit of an opportunity to at least head off some of the initial attacks that this system is going to have to withstand you would hope so yeah, so uh, there we go. That's uh, that's that. Either goodbye or on with the rest of the video. I don't know how Colin's going to edit this one. Now, additionally, there are other things going on. So Call of Duty Vanguard um, does appear to be going a little bit more narrative. That's something they generally try to push up with these Call of Duty games. Cold War actually had a fair bit of promise. It definitely felt like it was a good idea that wasn't really executed with enough uh, depth or enough runtime. Uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2019 Again, it had interesting ideas. It had some really good execution at the start. Then it just kind of devolved into generic. So they keep on doing this thing where they, they try, they fall a little bit short. As for this time, well, um, at, uh, yeah, was it, was it Comic-Con? Or which, uh, whatever con it was. Um, basically, yeah, it was New York Comic-Con where they said that they would like to make two sequels to Vanguard. So basically just some murmurings that they are wanting the Vanguard universe of Call of Duty to basically be its own thing, right? In the same way that they have the Black Ops franchise, the Modern Warfare franchise, they're probably going to want the Vanguard franchise. And you can really see how that makes sense. Um, if Vanguard is going to be, what, like late 40s, early 50s, a little bit of a alt-history timeline... You can see that as being one game. Black Ops, well, that's more your, you know, Vietnam and onwards, MK Ultra, 
getting a bit more, you know, psychological on it, and then to sort of do Michael Bay meets Catherine Bigelow. <laughs> is that what they're trying to do with the new modern warfare? But you can see how that is very strong for them. And if you look into the past, you go from, you know, you've got advanced warfare, you've got ghosts, you've got infinite warfare. Some of those just random standalone ones, well, that's just what they are, standalone. But for a lot of people, they do want that little sub-brand that they can identify with. So that's something we've heard. Who knows how it'll really turn out. Uh, now also, some talk about Vanguard being in Warzone, where it's just interesting because Warzone Season 6 Battle Pass now includes 24 items from Vanguard, uh, which can be earned by playing um, either Black Ops Cold War or Warzone and can be used immediately ahead of Vanguard's release. So basically, that's just them deepening the, well, the cross-pollination between their games, which itself is an interesting thing, especially considering the, uh, the handover from Cold War, or from Modern Warfare to Cold War, was a big mess with Warzone. It seems like they're really trying to not make that mistake again. Now, continuing with other things, then, we've got Vanguard Zombies and uh, Battlefield Hazard Zone. <laughs> I used to play zombies a bunch as a kid, and Hazard Zone does seem interesting to me. So, um, yeah, zombies, people love zombies. If you don't have zombies, that's not really ideal. So basically, the game overall is made by Sledgehammer, but they've now got it so that Vanguard does have a zombie mode that is being developed by Treyarch. So it's their first act sort of crossover, and I think that just shows this whole thing of our mission is, you know, have a lead dev, have a Call of Duty product every single year, but they're seemingly very willing for those cross-team collaborations. I also suspect that given some of the rumor mill that's been going on, they've maybe needed those cross-team collaborations in the past, so maybe they're just trying to, uh, you know, to institute that a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more clearly. I mean, I certainly remember, was it Black Ops 2 to Modern Warfare 3? It was just that thing, you know, all my friends were playing zombies, and then the version of that in the new game wasn't as good. It felt bad to people. Yeah, it's interesting. You would think that uh, you, you'd be able to recreate zombies in some capacity that in a better way, but I think this way actually really works because it lets Treyarch continue to do what they want to do and tell whatever story blends they want to have as well. Because they just, um, they just actually, the reveal trailer was about 45 minutes ago Yeah, for it, and it reception seems basically extremely good. Like, there's a, I think it's a remaster of a Shino Nima. I'd never played oh, zombies yeah. much, yeah, but yeah. yeah. So th that's coming through. Uh, and it's like, I mean, here's here's a comment saying, if I saw some still images from this trailer, I'd think it's Wolfenstein 4. So obviously it's a CG trailer, but it's like, it looks like an extremely good thing that they have specialized in. Yes. So it's like, damn, that's that's a great way to add value to what other people might consider as ah, a new Call of Duty. It's like, yeah, but it's almost a thing where zombies is kind of doing what I think they want the main series to do a lot of. Because mm. they're saying, you know, they want to continue writing Vanguard. They want to go, oh, here's the characters you care about. Here's all the stuff we want to bring forward. Whereas it feels like zombies have been kind of doing that through, not through more, uh, you know, standard types of narrative. Yeah, they're meta through, narrative, yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, but through weaving those little stories in. So I think that's actually maybe a good sign that this could work for them overall. Yeah. Now, uh, some of the timing here was done to run <laughs> alongside EA's reveal of Battlefield 20, uh, 2042's Hazard Zone. Hazard mode, though, or Hazard Zone, well, it is a squad-based extraction game, so very much taking inspiration from Escape from Tarkov. Um, Hunt Showdown, as, as an example for another one. And what's going to be fun is Ubisoft have uh, tried the same thing as a full game and have gotten a bit of trouble with their fans for it. As for this, though, it seems like a PvEVP, um, squad-based uh, situation, so eight squads, 32 players, dropping into the map and, uh, well, doing stuff, getting um, the dark market credits, which are the currency, um, so that there is uh, progression between games. So basically, if you want a bit of those Tarkov vibes, but in a battlefield setting with the silliness that can happen in a battlefield, it's a lot of fun, then that's the mode for you. So between traditional battlefield, portal, and hazard zone, that's what they've got going on for this year's offering, which does seem pretty decent. As for the game, I did hop into the beta. It definitely had performance issues. Um, I was on a laptop 3070, so... I mean, good GPU, but also laptop, but also... I've just seen a lot of reports of iffy performance, so hopefully that gets fixed up for launch. Um, what I saw was, like, good and fun, though, but... Um, yeah, I'd like to see it a little bit more stable. Now... 
Speaking of squad-based extraction game modes, Ghost Recon Frontline, because, um, oops, right. So Ubisoft showed up Ghost Recon Frontline, and it was received so poorly that the closed beta has, in fact, been delayed indefinitely. It was a battle royale mixed with a Escape from Tarkov sort of game that um, it just got dislike bombed. People were basically just saying, uh, Ghost Recon, we want PvE. That's the focus. Why are you making this into a thing that has a whiff of Battle Royale? We don't want this. I think that's a pretty simple way uh, to, to sort of capture a sentiment, especially in a world where, you know, you had Ghost Recon Wildlands, which started off not super great, but they really kept on building on it, and it became a game that people really, really enjoyed. And as you move on from that, you get uh, Breakpoint where they, they did that thing, and I hate it when games do this, I really do. And it, like I like sci-fi, but they sci-fi it up, and they bullet sponge it up. And it's almost as if sci-fiing it up just, you know, means that you can put in a whole bunch of drones and body armors and weapon types and stats and things that are not the core of the Ghost Recon experience. So uh, Breakpoint was a, you know, big old failure. They did try to fix it up afterwards, They've now tried to pivot away from that kind of game over to Frontline, and people have basically rejected it. I think very much wanting a PvE game. Because they enjoyed Wildlands, and they don't feel like the Wildlands experience has been offered up to them uh, much since from Ghost Recon. Yeah, I think it's kind of awkward because you, you talk about the sci fi elements, you talk about, like, you know, get your drones, get your body armor, and I'm just thinking, but the Division already exists. Yeah. And people are already playing the division too i'm not sure how well it's doing now overall but it you know it fits that niche quite well of the you know the, you and a couple of fellas playing you know the pve stuff and then you obviously you've got the you know the the pvp elements there so it's the kind of thing where i think they just completely and it, i actually as much as kotaku are you know kotaku the headline of ubisoft postpones close beta for ghost recon frontline the game nobody asked for I think is actually fairly accurate, largely speaking. Yeah. So it's like they were on point with Wildlands, shit the bed with Breakpoint, uh, in a couple of ways, and now they've just done it again. You're like, who who's making the decisions here? When you could just pay attention and go, well. So the spread of stuff we've got, we've got Rainbow Six PvP. Everyone likes that, largely speaking. Six does uh, or Siege does a great job. Yeah. It seems. Uh, then we've got Division Two, which is sort of more uh execution based in terms of you know you're you are your character doing things and getting gear in a sci-fi realm so what happened to the wildlands or the you know even go back to advanced warfighter stuff go yeah. back to like if people are asking for tactical stuff and it just seems like ubisoft have not the faintest idea what anybody who plays their games actually want it's yeah it is really strange it's like uh they're really trying to free to play live serviceify their their offerings as much as they can uh, i could suppose i can understand that from a business perspective but it does make them feel out of touch and i do feel bad for the the devs in cases like this a good mm. example that um there's a sort of parkour ish battle royale they did that everyone's forgotten about oh i can remember its name yeah i me too i've forgotten its name hyperscape as well. hyperscape. hyperscape yeah I've actually heard that it's like pretty good. It's got some neat gameplay innovations and things that it does well. It's just that thing of we produced an entry in a genre. And I think sometimes the people, that's not exciting. And here, you know, they've produced an entry in a genre using their Ghost Recon, uh, you know, that, that IP. Well, perhaps the people, it feels like that. It, it's, it's not what they associate with Ghost Recon. Therefore, that's not what they really want to get from it. Yeah, it feels to me like they're consistently caught up in trying to make a product to fit the product line in the same way you go, oh, we need a battle royale. A hyperscript didn't work. We need another one. What can we leverage to make a battle royale work mm -hmm. as opposed to how do we make what players actually want to play? Because I think that especially after Breakpoint and generally their lack of having strength in the... Because, you know, everyone knows Call of Duty versus Battlefield. Yeah. No one ever really went Call of Duty versus Battlefield versus Ghost Recon. No one yeah. went, no one has done that until today when, you know, today is actually basically this big crossover of three different Battle Royale kind of things happening all at once. 
Well, obviously, you know, uh, Battlefield's got Hazard Zone's dead, but it's like, what are they doing? Why don't they, you know, I don't like you said saying things like stay in your lane, but Ghost Recon's such a great franchise that doesn't have that part in the market, but Ubisoft would seem to be being run by people who are going, no, we need, we need the big monetizable thing as opposed to what would be a cool video game that would also be profitable enough. Yeah. That's really grim to see because it's, it feels, it, given how well I think, you know, obviously many issues on both, both of them, but between Call of Duty and Battlefield, they're the actual big hitters here compared to whatever Ubisoft are doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's grim. It's a pity. Um, I, you know, I always liked Ghost Recon when I was, when I was younger. Um, I was always too stupid for it, but I liked it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this just doesn't appeal to me. Mm. I mean, if I want to do this, I think Tarkov is the game to play. Mm. Right? So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> weird. That's the situation going on. And I suppose now you're a bit more ca caught up to date with the realm of shooting. And it's a very complicated one this holiday time around. Yeah. Because, you know, you say Call of Duty versus Battlefield, but this year Halo's a big contender. So it's going to be really, really fun. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm absolutely so. Exciting times. I will certainly be playing Halo Infinite. And for whatever <laughs> goddamn reason, I always end up doing something with the Call of Duty game for some reason. I still haven't worked out why. Same. Um, and yeah, I know this one is in the new engine, the Modern Warfare engine. And I loved how that engine felt. And I'm, I, I don't know why, but it, it always happens. I always end up playing them and I, I don't know how it happens. I don't know how it happens. Just suddenly I've, I've I just complete whim bought it. It's 3 a.m. And I finished the campaign in one sitting. And then I'm like, oh, great. I've knocked my entire week out of sync. Why have I done this? So anyway, maybe uh, maybe that's how you play the game as well. Have a great day. Farewell. <laughs>